Hi everybody, welcome to the, it's Tuesday the 2nd of March to the Recovery and Relapse meeting of Overeaters Anonymous. Um, my name is Rita Q and today I'm introducing the speaker, Sherry M. Sherry has been in OA for 16 years. She is 16 months recovered and has over 50 pounds weight loss. And Sherry, it's over to you now. Uh, just to confirm you have signed the speaker release as well. Yes. Absolutely, take it away Sherry. Okay, thank you so much. My name is Sherry M and I'm a grateful recovered compulsive overeater in Los Angeles. Thank you so much, Rita, for having me speak today and really for all the service you do in Overeaters Anonymous. I've seen you in many meetings and I'm so grateful to meet you through the pandemic and through Zoom. And this is one of the biggest gifts of this last year. Really, uh, my fellowship and program has never been stronger. So, you know, relapse is uh, definitely part of uh, my story and I want to start, I'm wondering if I should pull the pictures up. Um, maybe, maybe someone can pull some of the pictures up while I just start talking about my background. So I think it's important. Um, I, I think it's really important to talk about where I come from. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I believe that I was born with this deadly, progressive, fatal disease. This, uh, oh, we're going to scroll. Hang on. Let, go back to the top then. I'll go back to the top. So this is a picture of me in my 20s. And this is uh, one of the high, high points. Uh, maybe I didn't have my, uh, my solution, which was hardcore drugs at this time. But this is me wearing uh, pregnancy clothes here, probably around a size 12, 14. OK, you could scroll. That's my mom. This is me uh, two weeks into rehab uh, in February of 2004. And I'm already up one size in two weeks. Okay. And this is me in sobriety. The numbers are getting bigger on the scale. I changed my hair color because that was something I could do. But the weight, you know, and also to just take the distraction off the fact that all of my coworkers now are seeing me. I left for 30 days to go to rehab at one size. I came back now within two months, I'm from a size six to an eight. This is about a size 10 moving into a size 12. This is about three months prior to finding Overeaters Anonymous, okay? And this is me in Overeaters Anonymous. This was a, a time when I did have abstinence and I ran a marathon, which was uh, all due to my higher power and happy, joyous and free. Didn't last very long though, being free. Okay, keep going. This is me right before I found the solution to my, this is my sophomore year, so I'm about 15 years old. This is when the weight starts really pouring on for me. I had had it pretty hidden, although my mother was constantly talking about it, wanting to take me to, so I was going to diet doctors here, getting shots. My mom was giving me laxatives, that kind of thing. I found the solution, which is, and the next page will reflect that within Less than a year, here's my solution, which is cocaine and crystal meth. And I'm gonna to continue to do these hardcore drugs from 16 until I'm 33 years old. So I, it was worth it to me to kill myself with drugs in order to maintain uh, you know, a, 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 what I thought was acceptable body image. Okay, we can exit out of there. Thank you, that's so fun. Thank you for um, letting me text those to you. and email them. I want to tell you that I was a very vain compulsive overeater. So I don't have a lot of pictures at all at my top weight. In fact, I would always say I'll take the picture everybody, or I would mysteriously go to the bathroom very egocentric would not let any or I'd be in the very back of people so they couldn't see my body. Um, so I don't have any pictures at my top weight, which was busting out of uh, size 16. Uh, just about, I think the last time I weighed was a 177 and I'm 5'5". Five five. And that was all like within six months of me getting sober. So just cutting back to uh, where, where, where it all began. I, I truly believe that my circumstances contributed probably to, to creating a compulsive overeating situation, but I do believe that I was born with it. I think that my body is abnormal in the physical sense. What does that mean? It means that when I ingest certain substance, 
when I eat something that's an allergic reaction in my body, I crave more immediately. Whereas all of my friends in school could have one cookie that their mom packed for them. I would have that cookie, plus I'd bring money and I'd have to get at least two, three, four more. I was never satisfied. Insatiable appetite from the time, I'm gonna say I really started becoming aware of it at about eight years old. I grew up in an abusive, uh, sexually abusive, physically abusive, uh, neglectful home and environment. Uh, I didn't trust anybody in my family, nor did I bond with anybody in my family. I had uh, one older sibling, I still do, and she was trying to get rid of me from the time I came home from the hospital. And so I, when I, when I went into the cupboard and put a Reese's peanut butter cup in my mouth, I'll never forget, it was right around the time that some of these things were happening, I was eight years old. And I remember thinking, this is how I'm gonna survive. I had this conscious thought of this, this feeling, this sensation that I'm getting, this joy from this food is gonna save me. And I continued to stuff, stuff myself. And really, I just, I never knew, I didn't have an off switch in my body. Um, just massive quantities, you know, always extra large this, extra large that. Although I was a picky foodie. So if we would have like a pizza, I would pull off every single topping I didn't like and end up with just the dough. I mean, I was very, very picky. I still am. I don't like a lot of different things. Um, I wouldn't just eat anything. I, I wouldn't eat cheesecake, honestly, if you paid me. I think it's disgusting, but that's for me. And that's why we don't all have the same type of um, alcoholic foods, right? I have mine and I have my go-tos and that's what I have to identify. What are the foods that I went to? Coincidentally, it's so wonderful being here in London or, or where, where is this meeting located? I don't even know. It's in England, but um, my grandmother's a war bride from World War II and is English. And my grandfather was there. Um, and so I come from a military family and he brought her over to the U US and my mother was born in London, so I have English as a heritage and Basque. Um, so I, I feel very fondly of England. And uh, so, you know, tea and biscuits, right? That was every time I went to my grandmother's was, hello, let's have some tea and biscuits. And my grandma still has her accent to this day, or well, she passed away, but up until the time she died living in the US. So biscuits were my thing. And I have to say, I was death by, you know, somebody who I really admire in program says death by Dorito in his talks. And mine was death by biscuits, death by cookies, any kind of cookie you can imagine. And my mom was a baker, so she never talked to me, uh, never said I love you or anything like that. But when I would come home from school, she would have baked all of these cookies and she would have baked, uh, you know, her English desserts and her trifle and her, um, and then her eclairs and all these things. And we would just binge on it. And then she would hand me laxatives. So this was about the time I was 14. Uh, my mom was a periodic. I can't take her inventory, but this disease runs wild in my family. I have a grandmother who died from it. So uh, the name of my game was more, 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 <laughs> never satisfied. One was never going to do it for me. I knew it from the get go. I, I didn't understand why anyone would stop at one. It was full blown throttle. So then I found my solution, which was the solution to thinking about food, um, gaining weight and being uncontrollable, that uncontrollable feeling of not being able to stop. And I found these hardcore drugs and I did those, like I said, uh, for many, many years, um, had a career going with the drugs, uh, didn't, I could go two days without eating. And then if I did, I would just have what I wanted to have, which was a pint of a Haagen-Dazs and a bag of Cheetos, like crunchy. That's, and that was how I lived for a while. And then I knew I was gonna die, I was gonna overdose. And, and I was so afraid to give up the, uh, the drugs because I knew that my eating disorder had just been doing push-ups. I, I didn't do anything to arrest the, the disease except for I just put it at bay. And, and then I realized I can't go on like this. I, I'm literally gonna overdose and I'm gonna die. And uh, part of me was okay with that, honestly. From where I come from, that is also part of my story is getting sober and getting clean and removing the food uh, has been a very difficult process since it was the one thing that I had in life that I could rely on. It was, it was everything. I wanna talk about um, you know, going into recovery. So I got into recovery. You saw a picture there, two weeks I gained a size. It was uh, all you can eat, 
you know, gourmet food chef on premises. I took all my savings to go there. So it was like a cruise ship for me. And I started, I wanted to get my money's worth. So I would literally have three meal, three plates at every meal. And then they approached me and said, you know, what, Sherry, like the psychologist, you know, you're here for the drugs. And I said, I told you, I mean, I told them that before I checked in, that I'm here for food, drugs, and alcohol. And they said, we have to deal with the drugs and the alcohol. And that is true for me today, even though food is my primary addiction, because it's the first one that I started with. The truth is, I've never compulsively overeaten and then tried to call a drug dealer or, you know, gone to drink. But every time I drank, I went to food. And so, so it is true that I have to stay clean and sober and coherent in order to not go to the food. So cut to, so I entered Overeaters Anonymous, uh, the best part of my story, uh, six months into my sobriety, gained six sizes in six months. So even though that was my top, I am so certain that it was just, I mean, it was off and running, uncontrollable, three fast food restaurants, plus the grocery store binging, closing my blinds, binging my brains out, passing out, coming to, doing it again, watching TV. My life was so, it was just me and my food and the TV. That's what it looked like. And I just knew that I was going to die. So luckily, I had had very smart feet in my other program, and I had totally conceded to that other program. Like, totally step one, done, knew it was a deadly thing. And because of that, that's the only reason why I wasn't a bigger size. When I went to someone and I said, I'm going to die. I want to kill myself. That's what I said. I said, you know what? I was in the dressing. I was actually getting a, yet another bigger size. I finally saw myself in the mirror. And I said to myself that thought, if this is what sobriety is, I'm going to kill myself. And I was serious. So I went to her and told her this. And she said, so-and-so goes to the HAL program. You should call her. So I did. Followed her to meetings. That's where I started my journey. I got the food plan. I got abstinent. And I had a long, and I had the weight loss, right? So all the weight came off. I learned how to eat. We all were doing way to measured food and chewing gum in between. That lasted for about a year. And I realized that it was a punitive program for me. And it didn't seem reasonable with my, um, it just didn't seem you know, it, it's it. What was what it was doing for me is starting over from eating a piece of fruit as a snack led me every time they said start over. I went to the grocery store and binge my brains out. So I, I didn't think that was a solution. So I entered Overeaters Anonymous shortly after. I've been there ever since. I've never left Overeaters Anonymous. I have had long bouts of what I'm now going to tell you was a diet plan with group support, abstinence. Right? It was abstinence because. Because what I thought I was recovered, not recovered, I thought I was in recovery and it was progress, not perfection. I used this, this statement from the big book to justify me still getting comfort from food. So I did this off and on in program. Uh, I was free from refined sugar and I was free from flour for many times. And then I'd always go back. I'd always go back. So I would last a few years, sometimes months, but then I'd always come right back. And I remember one of the last times that I went to sugar was right after my best friend died of cancer. And uh, that was about eight years ago now. And I remember leaving, I had got run to the hospital. I just missed her, she passed, she was 40 years old. And I saw her dead body. And you know, that pain of that for me was just excruciating. So I went home and I was actually house sitting where they have little kids. And, and I opened up the cupboard and I got animal crackers. You know, of course, that's such a kid thing to do, you know, for comfort. This is what I did as a kid. I used to babysit all the time <laughs> to make money and I would just eat everyone's food, you know. And so I went in there and I ate those crackers and I laid on the couch for two days and just was in the sugar, in the sugar, in relapse. I didn't care. I said, this is what I need to do. This is what God wants me to do. And then I realized I had a small voice that said, your friend who just passed away would would kill to be alive today and you're killing yourself. And that was the thought I had. And I thought, how can I live like this when my friend's not even here to have a chance of living? And I met her in the rooms of Overeaters Anonymous as well. So we had that connection. So I, um, so then I went back and then at my, I defined my new abstinence as, this is another thing I'm gonna, there's, there's gonna be a lot of I statements. I did this, I did that, I was running the show. I, and every time I did what I thought I needed to do, self-will run riot, all roads led back to the food. So I went to over back to, you know, right back and it was January 1st. 
And I said, my new defined abstinence, I wanted to make it easy for myself so I couldn't fail, was gonna be no refined sugar. So that's what I'm gonna celebrate. So I started taking candles for six years with no refined sugar. Meanwhile, I was compulsively overeating. So the definition of abstinence, which says that we refrain from compulsive overeating didn't apply to me because I'm different and I have this horrible background and I'm going to therapy and I'm doing this and I'm, I'm doing childhood trauma at work and, um, and I'm maintaining the weight loss. So my case is different. Therefore, I can now switch over and substitute food. So now I'm going to go to paleo and now I'm going to go to keto muffins and I'm not going to eat refined sugar. I'm going to take candles, but all along I could never get well because I was just ingesting another substance on a lower level. It was like going from heroin to pot, right? I mean, it just was a little bit less extreme, but I was keeping the allergy alive. And then I realized that I have a mental problem, the disease centers in my mind. So I can never come up with a solution to this deadly disease. This is a progressive, permanent, fatal disease, which I have finally, after 15 years of being in the rooms, and I'm talking in the room sponsoring people, being doing all the service commitments, three to four, doing all the tools, and doing the steps, doing big book workshops. I did the steps 16 times before I got recovered because for me, I really thought that the steps, especially in all, all these programs and I'm in ACA and I'm in Al-Anon and I'm in AA and I'm outside therapy and I'm doing all this body work and da da da, da. What I didn't get was that the physical was never gonna solve the spiritual problem. I was approaching it from completely the wrong way. And what I see is because of my where I come from, for me, going back to the food was always a sense of control for me. I couldn't control my environment. I was in fear a lot of the time and live with anxiety. But the one thing I could always be certain of was if I go to the store and get a bag of whatever, a box of whatever, that I'm going to, I know exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to come home. I'm going to, I'm going to give myself comfort. I'm going to put the tube on and I'm going to just eat and I'm going to be able to breathe. And that's the reward I get because life is unbearable for someone like me without a spiritual solution. It is unbearable to live in my skin. It's unbearable to live on this earth. And the and if I can just give myself that comfort and because I could sort of control it, I feel like the best time I've ever had in the program was my first six months because I had the desperation of the weight. Being in maintenance in Overeaters Anonymous for 15 years and this slow, slow death of killing myself weekly, daily, every three days and what it was doing to me, wasting my life, just circling the drain, circling the drain. I could never get well. Cut to, so funny that I, I've been cleaning out my emails. We're getting ready to move to another state in a few months. And I found these emails from when, and I always have had a food sponsor. So, and I've always been honest. So I've got that going for me. I got honesty going. So every time I binged, I'm writing in, I was doing nightly reviews, uh, 10 steps inventory. So I'm writing it, ate a bag of scanty popcorn and sending it to my food sponsor. I'm telling everybody what I'm doing. I'm thinking if I'm just honest, that's going to cure it. Being honest is going to do it. Um, you know, switching brands, you know, doing all, switching to paleo. And, you know, and I just saw these tech, these emails and it was, this is what it looked like. Five paleo muffins, bag of and then I put a salad in the middle of the day, salad with some grilled chicken, another paleo bar, another keto bar. That was one day, you know, this is my, and I just looked, I had every day in here from 2018, which is when I found my big book group and that's how I became recovered. So I found them in 2018, a vision for you. I hope that's okay to mention, saved my life. And, um, and I started, but this is, this is what a slow case I am. Five sponsors in a vision for you, not for any, it wasn't like anybody fired me. I'm telling you, God brought five women to help me. One had to leave for a time difference, time zone difference, one left program, da, da, da. it didn't matter. Every time I had to go back to step one and what I could see is I wasn't surrendered. It took five, right? So in 2018, I started, the desperation was horrible or so I thought. So I let go of the faux dessert, the lookalike desserts. That was the first thing. 
Then I was managing and controlling crunchy items. And I can still do this. I, 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 I can still eat this. When I go to Mecca, I can still have corn chips. No. And then I saw the last, the very last binge, which was 11 to 2019. My recovered date is November 3rd of 2019. And the, what I wrote to the food sponsor was, I gave up these, I, I said, I found a vision sponsor. I am done. I'm going to die. Only God can help me. And I give up. I just give up. And do you know- 20 the, minutes. Thank you. The hardest thing that I thought would be letting go of the, of the comfort or something to just take the edge off of life. And the minute I gave it to God, my higher power, it became the, it was the easiest thing. It turns out to be the easiest part of the program. It wasn't hard at all. It was in my mind. And I am joyfully recovered today. I'm joyfully, it's more than abstinence. I am free. I have a freedom that I didn't know was possible for somebody like me. I am a hard nut to crack when it comes to this food. I would not do it anybody else's way. So the fact that I finally surrendered and said, just take it all, just take it, take it. What do I have to do? I started working with a dietitian. Actually, I had been working with a dietitian for a few months before November 3rd, which was helpful. Yeah, I, why would I come up with my own food plan? I mean, some of these things I had to start questioning. I'm a smart person. So when people started telling me things in layman terms, like for instance, why do you, would you ever have salad dressing with Jack Daniels whiskey in the ingredients as the sixth ingredient? And I was like, no, that's ridiculous. I just celebrated 17 years of sobriety. I mean, I would never think of jeopardizing it. So why is it okay to have honey and maple syrup when you've identified that sugar, you know, baked goods is your thing? What are the ingredients? People started helping me become a detective. I really, it oh. wasn't sugar and thought, pardon me? Oh, it's okay. I thought I heard the time. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, what were the ingredients? The top, you know, what were the ingredients? What, what are the things I go to for comfort, right? What are the things I think about? What are the things I can't imagine living without? What are the things that I'm negotiating over right now while I'm speak, speaking to the sponsor? What are the things that I'm substituting? When my, when my real foods aren't available, what am I substituting? What are the behaviors? Eating in front of the TV, eating while I'm standing up, tasting food while I'm, you know, what are the things that lead to compulsive overeating? This was, this opened up a whole thing that nobody you know, ever told me about. They, they, people were telling me to make a red light, green light, and yellow light li list. I was killing myself with yellow light foods because I could manage and control them. And I was just killing myself with yellow light foods for years and program. That does not make sense for somebody like me. And I'm just speaking for me. And there's room for everybody in Overeaters Anonymous. And you may not be a real compulsive overeater. And so some of what I'm saying might not apply for you. But thank God, thank God, I know finally in my, not here, but here, that I am a real hope to die, compulsive overeater. There is only one solution for me. And what that is, is entire abstinence followed and in conjunction with the steps as outlined and as written in the big book precisely. Not just doing some steps that I want, but precisely. And I work this program for fun and for free. I, I am not white knuckling to the next meal. I don't even think about food. That's what's mind boggling to me. The best year of my life, one of them was this last year. That's crazy with everything that's going on in the world and in my own house. Husband's cancer diagnosis, me having to have surgery, me having loss of income, husband early retirement being in the same house with my husband all day, every day for a year. It, I didn't need a reason to eat before. Just to take the edge off was enough. 
and now we're packing up to move. All of these stressors and not once have I thought, you know, maybe I can have something extra at my lunch later or maybe I can do, it's just, it's been removed. And you know, when I came into program, I felt abandoned, unloved, unwanted and invisible. These are some of the characteristics. And I certainly did not think that God was there for me because of my childhood and what had happened. And what I have today is the most amazing relationship with my higher power, which provided the spiritual solution to my spiritual malady. I could not get my higher powers help if I still had one hand on the food. It didn't matter. I had 90% help, but I couldn't get 100%, which means I couldn't get to a recovered state. What does recovered mean? It means that I'm totally surrendered to God's will. I am neutral and I'm free and I don't, and food is, it's like, it's, it's like the problem that I had my entire life. I just turned 50 last year. So up until what, I was 49. The problem has been rooted out of me. Something has taken this problem out of me and it doesn't exist for me today. As long as I continue to change everything about me, right? Because the same person will continue relapsing. If I don't change everything about me and let God do the changing, then I will always find a reason to go back to food. Food worked. This is why I continued relapsing over and over and over. And for anybody, and I know that dilemma of saying, we say one thing, right? This is what I used to say to many crying on the phone in fetal position. Food is killing me. I really want to stop eating today. Can you help me? I'll, I'll do whatever you say. So talking, I did a lot of this. And then what would happen? I'd go back up into my head. An hour or two would pass by and I overreacted. I must have overreacted and now I'm back in the food. And this was, this is why I can never, you know, the only person in my life really who's ever tried to kill me is me. So why would I ever rely on this brain that's tried to kill me to come up with a solution to an illness? It's like going to the doctor and somebody telling me that I have cancer, let's just say my friend had cancer and then me leaving there and saying thank you for the information I'm going to go do this and that and I'm going to juice and try to do this but uh, you know but they're saying this is the solution but I, I'm not taking it because I know better and that's what I was doing in Overeaters Anonymous even though my sponsor I had all the best sponsors you know there, there's the best sponsor in the world is not going to help me recover the only thing that worked is surrender. And what does that look like? I just want to wrap up with what that looks like. That looks like somebody saying, you know, if somebody, if my doctor came to me today and said, Sherry, you can no longer eat oatmeal. Uh, I, I would say, thank you, take it. Or you can no longer, I, I don't even have foods in my, in my food plan that I would care about, you know, take it. I can't eat a yam. I like yams. Okay. I like my healthy food. Take it. I, I wouldn't, I just, there's no fight. I don't know if that makes any sense, but there's no defense. The biggest joy has been letting God transform me in a way that I didn't even know was possible. Knowing that I am the problem in every one of my situations, constantly looking for my part in things has been the biggest gift of my life. If somebody else is the problem, to any of my situations, then there is no solution and I'm powerless. But what I do have power over is changing everything about me. And this program continues to amaze me. When I'm free from the food, I'm now free to live life on life's terms as God would see me living it. Which means that not only did I yield to my, I, I love that word yield. When I said, I'm done, God, do with me what you will. One minute. Thank you. Just do with me what you will. And also, I mean, I have to say, I did the steps quickly in eight weeks, right? Eight to 10 weeks, quickly. 
because we have to stay ahead of the disease. You know, the disease is here, right? The disease center is in my mind. And I used to do the, the steps like January will be step one and February will be step two. And by March, I'm in a bag eating, eating. I have to stay ahead of the disease. And how do I stay ahead of the disease? I don't rely on what I did yesterday for today. Today is a brand new day. But when I wake up in the morning, I have a clean slate. I don't even remember what was going on yesterday because I inventory everything and everything is... If I was to die today, I am current with everything in my life. And I can tell you that I have tried to be the best woman that I can. And I have tried to just keep showing up and try to change all of these ways that I show up and to try to be a better human being. And I didn't care about doing any of that before I was free. Food is not. Fine. Thank you so much. If food is still an option, then God cannot be. And I choose life, which is my higher power today. And if I choose self-will, then I'm choosing death. And I'll just end it there. Thank you so much for letting me be of service. I can't wait to hear from all of you. Sherry, thank you so much for that wonderful message of experience, strength, and hope. I'm just going to stop the recording.